Uh, I was uh, recently updating my resume and I, I counted the number of uh, uh, subjects and topics and I found that I was developing developed more than 40 different uh, courses. So it, it's a lot of uh, area that I cover, like painting, color theory, anatomy, visual communication, treatment. All this helps me to articulate my own world of where am I in this uh, visual. So I also participated in about 50 exhibitions, got five awards, and uh, curated uh, Artropolis Art in Exile 2003, and now I'm curating post-digital and project that I'm going to explain at the end of this talk. So let's start from the beginning, like uh, where it starts, it's a phase one. Uh, very often we talk about composition, and we mixed up, I think, in my mind, I, I mixed always composition and the pictorial space. The idea of pictorial space for me was like a something hidden in, inside the image, because you know what, we, image is always two-dimensional, right? Image is always a slice, it's always iron, it's always compressed, pressed, and, and it's hard to talk about space in image. And uh, when, you, when you think about composition, I think this is a great way to, to explain the difference between the composition and the space. Composition is iron, flat, and you can navigate it on, on this act, uh, uh, left, uh, how to say that, A, B basis. Like, uh, you know, left, right, up, down. So you can kind of move in this manner. And then, for me, this is pictorial space. It's like a multi-perspective points in a, in a space connected with some kind of activities, events, and things that we kind of uh, it's really difficult to articulate and, and compress this into uh, a picture, iron it, and make it look like, well, a flat plane. So the difference between composition and space for me is obvious. When I talk about pictorial space, I'm really talking about events that are kind of sporadically sparkled within this living space that we live, and then image is what? It's compression. So, basically, why I started talking, thinking about space is the, the reason that we live in a very determined grid world that we call the Cartesian space, which is like a, the life, like grids, 3D. And look at, look at us here, sitting in the grid chairs. And uh, when you look at these little holes on the wall, you'll realize that all of them are okay, but there is one hole there extra hole at the, at the beginning, and then three holes here that kind of run away from the grid. And I am interested in these holes that are outside of the grid. So, Cartesian space is like 500 years, or let's 300, 400 years, sitting on our head and telling us, mapping the world, telling you where you go, blah, 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 Googles and stuff, but really, what about some other way of thinking. The Cartesian space gave us a very kind of anthropocentric perspective, which is actually the camera, the view of the of you now sitting there, very kind of specifically in time and space, placed, planted, and that's your point of view. And that's how most images are made, and every single photo is made the same way. So I, I ask myself, is that really, really, really the only way to think about pictorial space? And the worst thing that uh, comes to me with my mind is like, why do we have to imitate this Cartesian space even in a virtual space? Like we have computers today that allows us to put all kinds of things inside and st still we are, we are kind of following the same coordinates, the same grids and systems. It seems to me that it's hard for us to accept a shift of, of uh, uh, what they call the paradigm, the shift of thinking, and we adopted the space that we all are common with. And then, when, when you put these holes here, somebody will say, why do you need these three holes, like, scattered around? Like, can you just fill them up with something? Or, or, or should you make all the holes like that? And then, you know, it involves not only questions about all, but urban, cultural, geopolitical, ecological, moral questions. Everything gets connected with this notion of space, because you know what? Where do you live? And how far you live? What is related to your life? Can you reach points? How do you connect them? And all these issues are constantly bugging you every day, like, right? 
And then today we are trying to break the, the fear, but fear is this, is the fear of empty space. And of course you know that you are afraid of it because it looks like this. This is a Hubble NASA photo of some kind of nebula. And uh, if, if you think about the universe, right, it looks like that. It looks like not very inviting, not very pleasant. And of course we have this kind of horror back to it, uh, you know, feeling. And artists who try to deal with this emptiness, like a Kaspar David Friedrich, uh, it, it's really kind of an uninviting space, dangerous and, and uh, you know, not very pleasant to think of. Um, it was the George uh, Brach, Brach who invented uh, cubism and actually was, he, he admitted that all his life he was mostly interested in new notion of space because at the same time, uh, you know, the Einstein broke the, the, the mold of Cartesian space and invented a theory of relativity and uh, this is the first attempt that painters tried to paint theory of relativity. And what does it mean? Cubism tries to remove us from the point of view, from a static point of view, from the tripod, from, from that thing, and put, uh, put you everywhere in the space at the same time. And then, of course, the futurists, including Bala and others, they, they try to deal with the space of, of dynamics, of movements, and so here you can see the movement becomes frozen in some kind of liquid space, and uh, of course motion pictures and animation and everything that is connected with it comes to mind. Nikola Tesla was a person, I think, who understood the, the meaning of the spaces and, and past potential of the spaces, not only as a passive air, and, and some people call it even like, in art we call it negative space, you know, when you compose something that's, that's negative space, can you imagine the word, like negative? So, he understood that the notion that it is not actually negative, but it's full, full of some strange potential, and that he tried even to, to think about transmitting energies on distances through this void. And uh, an interesting discovery here by looking at uh, Vasily Kandinsky, a piece, composition number eight, in, uh, 19, this exactly 90 years ago. He did this uh, composition based on his weird uh, synesthetic mind, and I, I hope that you know what's synesthesia. Uh, we talked about this uh, affect, aspect of brain uh, merging the, all your senses in, into an uh, interesting system that you can kind of see the sound, you can taste, um, taste uh, color, and so on and so forth, right? So he had synesthesia and he painted that, but look at this image here, the Fermilab top quark that they, they have uh, this image of how they break the quarks and how they make them, and look at the detail from them, Kandinsky's painting. So I think a very interesting things happen in art, and artists are sometimes even capable to see things, foresee the things that are going to happen, and today we have Olafur Eliasson, who is very interested in the notion of voids and spaces, he is making very complex installations, immersive, and uh, that gives you a kind of sensation of entering into this void, but not anymore the passive one, but, and uh, Zaha Hadid, uh, in, influenced by um, suprematists, like uh, by Malevich and all these Russian constructivists who started uh, this new uh, generation of, of visuals. And uh, I don't have time to talk about how modern started and what happened, but there is lots of paradoxes in, in, the, in the historic evolution of the arts that we are not yet aware of, and I believe that that was the most intriguing part of, that, that I started this journey for, and that I admire Thomas Saraceno, who is also making some very really interesting low-tech installations, but allows you to experience almost high-tech virtual spaces, like immersive spaces, that, that your body enters into almost like a virtual zone. And, of course, I would like to mention today's technology and new media, that all this kind of software that makes uh, data 
visible. And, uh, and uh, this kind of infographics or new technology allows us to see, uh, per perceive the sound and, and all kinds of activities in the space that's something we cannot perceive by our senses. And I think technology is beautiful prosthetics that allows you to see what you cannot see, to, to touch what you cannot, and so on and so forth. It's almost like a, another set of senses that we are given with these machines, right? So, uh, let's start from here. I will show you the little animation of one Polish guy about string theory. <laughs> with this kind of speed that we live with it. And uh, thinking and talking about particle, one student said to me, Vieko, will it be possible that the whole universe is made out of one single particle? And I said, yes, you are right. darkness in this void, navigate to some space, because it's, I, I believe it's easy to get lost and just have a deep dive. And that's what I did. In 2003, I started up the, a little book. I purchased the Opus, a uh, little jumbo sketchbook with 350 pages, and I said, oh, I should put the title on this book. And I said, okay, I'll call it Semantics of Space. And uh, what happened is during the 2003, I filled it up. Every day I was thinking about something, I was making a little notes, and I wrote something there, and, and within a year, it was filled up, and suddenly I realized that that's the best thing I ever did. Uh, it, it, it brought me like, you know, thousands of drawings that came after it, the notes and essays, and it generated like 10 years of uh, kind of research in physics where they talk about particle physics and whatever, the M physics, the string, and, and all kinds of things, you know? When you think about physics and science and art, today it's still all divided. Unfortunately, we live in the age of divisions, right? When everything is black and white, and good or bad, and blah, 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 and zero and one. And I believe strongly that it's not the right way to live, and I think that the right way to live is to be a scientist and artist at the same time, which uh, has been proven many times in the Renaissance, and every single artist in Renaissance was also a scientist, as we know, and uh, I always ask myself, why division? And I was always told that I'm not good at math, and uh, therefore I ended up being a painter. No, so what can you do without math? You can, but I was always kind of interested in this kind of scientific research, and, and I was always like really, really, really curious about physics in the high school, and somehow I ended up painting, you know, <laughs> because they told me I'm not good at the numbers, <laughs> and uh, and now I realize that numbers are not never 